Let's see what happens when I put some voltage across it. A lot of smoke. Oh, and it melted. Oh, well, that was the problem. Tanner, tech, Tanner, tech, Tanner, Tanner, tech, Tanner, tech, Tanner. Hello, this is Tanner Tech. A few weeks ago, I came across this old Model 134 digital multimeter by Data Precision. It's a pretty cool device. It looks like it was made in the late 70s, perhaps. And it's got a really interesting display. You can see here that it's neon, it's the color of neon, but it's built in a similar fashion to a uh, vacuum fluorescent display, although it has some characteristics of a Nixie tube display. But alas, this device doesn't work when I connect the test leads to a uh, voltage source to measure. Nothing happens even when it's on DC volts. And I change this around and, and nothing happens. So today we're going to come inside here and see if we can fix it up. Before I get started though, I'd like to give a special thanks to Kaiweets for sending me this brand new multimeter. This will be very useful in trying to fix this ancient multimeter. And especially because my old Radio Shack meter has just about kicked the bucket. This Kaiweets multimeter is really cool and I'll talk about some of the functionalities that it has near the end of the video. But let's get started on this thing. First step, I'm going to turn off the Variac that's powering it and unplug this thing so I don't get shocked. And then we'll see if we can crack this open. Ooh, this thing probably hasn't been opened in many years. Not ever. Oh. Oh, some nice dust came out of there. There we go. Wow. Got some classic old integrated circuits over there. Another thing I find interesting about this is it has these metal bars that go across next to the IC, and on the circuit board, it's actually labeled bus bar. So you have a legitimate bus bar. I'm not sure why this is so thick. I mean, I can't imagine much current is going through here. So now I'm going to take off a few of these screws on the bottom so I can remove these two sides and get access to the circuit boards inside. All right, so before I go any more into fixing this meter, we're going to take a look at something that's pretty rare these days. And it is a manual that comes with it that not only tells you how to use it, but gives you important specifications such as signals you should see at different points, a full schematic diagram, and some information on how it works. This is a very useful diagram that I found in the manual. It's helpful for understanding how this device works. So here we have the voltage and current inputs that go into this thing called the input signal conditioner. And basically what the input signal conditioner does is it scales any of the voltages that you apply to it to between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5 volts. And it scales any currents that are inputted into it to between uh, negative 50 millivolts and positive 50 millivolts. It then goes into this thing called the buffer amplifier. Basically what this does is it separates anything that happens here from anything that happens here. So what happens in these circuits doesn't affect the voltage here. Basically it makes a very high impedance circuit. It also amplifies the current signal since that's between uh, negative 50 millivolts and positive 50 millivolts. So it's the same scale as the voltages between uh, negative 0.5 and positive 0.5 volts. And then goes to the absolute voltage to current converter and the current to frequency converter. And basically this takes that voltage range and it converts it into a variable frequency range. And that frequency is what's analyzed by this part of the circuit which uses uh, analog components. I mean, it does use uh, integrated circuits and such, but it's able to convert that frequency to a readout for the display. This final circuit diagram will be one of the most important parts of this repair job because I know what voltage is approximately to expect at each point and what frequency is, and I can use my new Kiwitz multimeter to test some of these different points. All right, let's get to testing some voltages. I'll fire up my Kiwitz multimeter. Kind of cool. It shows you which ports to plug in your cables to when you turn it to a certain setting. I, I currently have five volts input here, so we should be seeing five volts on this display, but we're not. So let's check some of the points in the circuit to see what's going on here. Ow, okay, so I just might have found part of the problem and also burnt my finger. So I was leaning over here looking at some of this stuff while it was running, and I felt a lot of heat. And so I reached down and I touched this resistor, which wasn't the best idea, and I got burned. This brings me to another 
I guess, interesting use of this meter, and it's the fact that it has a temperature probe. So this is probably the best way to measure things in the future. But that's definitely a problem. That resistor shouldn't be getting that hot. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's a toasty resistor. That's up to like 180. Okay, I'm turning off the power. That is not good. It's 190. I wonder if anything else is hot in here. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. So this resistor right here is the high wattage one that I just got burned on because this resistor is super hot and there's way more current flowing through here than there should be. So it might be something in the power supply that is the problem. And I'm looking at these three Zener diodes because these old Zener diodes have a tendency to fail. So one trick for measuring voltages in a circuit when you don't want to flip it around to measure the other side is to measure voltages on things that are easy to measure, such as diode leads, because you know what side of a diode is the side that's labeled on the schematic. So I see here that ground goes to a couple different things. It goes to the anode of diode 14 and the cathode of diode 13. So that'll be a good point to measure ground from. And I'm also going to measure the 9 volts here. That should be on the uh, cathode of diode 14. We also want to measure to see if there's negative 15 volts present here. That is on the anode of diode 13 or the cathode of diode 12. So I have one of my multimeter probes on the anode of diode 14. That will be ground. And we can see some similar things that are close to it. We have diode 13 behind it. It's a big Zener diode back there. And we have diode 16 and 17 and diode 12. I think 12, 14, and 13 are the main Zener diodes we want to take a look at here. Okay, so we got it running. That resistor is heating up, so don't touch it. Let's check for some stuff. So, on the other end of this Zener diode, oh, 9 volts, that's good. On the end of this resistor, 9.22 volts. Oh, that means this side must be connected to here. That means the that Zener diode is doing its job at least. Okay, I'm not sure if you're able to see this, but on the resistor on this side, we have 41.68 volts, and then a voltage drop of 9.29 volts. I just did some calculations regarding that resistor as well to see how much current it was pulling. It had a voltage drop of about 31.7 volts across it, which means it has about 0.15 amps flowing through it, which means that it's dissipating 4.91 watts, which is perfectly within spec as it is a 5 watt resistor. So I guess I just forgot how inefficient these linear power supplies were, and that resistor really is meant to get that hot. So now that we know that this part of the power supply is working, like that 9 volt source, we can check back here. Oh! That voltage right there should be approximately negative 15 volts. That's only 0.6 volts there. So right now I'm probing the anode of diode 13. That voltage does not look right. Uh, let me probe the end of diode 12 too. If I probe the anode of diode 12, we should get negative 18 volts. Nice solid 0 0.2 volts. Okay, so I think diode 13 might actually be bad. Also, before desoldering anything here and messing with the circuit board beneath, I think some safety is important here. So we see that this capacitor is rated at 300 volts. Same with this one. And this is the part of the power supply that supplies the neon tube in the display. So that is a dangerous capacitor, something to discharge. Here is the old diode. It's definitely not a common package that I see. Definitely from the 80s or so. But this is the Zener diode that was giving me problems. Let's give it a test. I'll hook up a resistor to it and hook it up in reverse bias mode. And once we turn it up to 15 volts, we should see some current. Oh. There is some current there, but it doesn't happen until around 18 volts. So this is a new Zener diode that I have, uh, wired again in the series with the 100 ohm resistor. As soon as it hits like 16 volts or 15.8, it starts drawing current. So I'll solder this in and see if that changes anything. 
It's all soldered in place now. I know this isn't the most traditional way, but this is just temporary to see if this was the actual problem. Uh, in the long run, I'll probably solder it in normally through the hole. All right, here we go. Nothing's exploded yet, so that's good. Let's measure the voltage across that diode. Still 0.69 volts. That's not right. So, in looking through this a little bit more, I think I may have located a, a potential source of problem here. So with this electrolytic capacitor, if this C13 is bad, it could be shunting current through here to ground and bringing both these points down. So I'm going to test that capacitor, perhaps replace it, and see if that's the problem. If it's not, we could have a short somewhere else in this big circuit. Here's the capacitor. I know it looks like I'm about ready to blow it up, but I'm really not, I promise. Let's charge it up and see if it holds. Yeah, I don't see any leakage across it. Looks like it's working. So I've got the D12 hooked up in series with a 100 ohm resistor. I've got 5 volts across the whole thing. And we should expect to see around 3 volts across the Zener diode. This is actually the better way to test it than just to see if any current flows. That's kind of a bad way. So you can see here that there's 3 volts across it. So D12 is not a problem. See, so if I take the resistance from the anode of D12 to the anode of D14, we get a resistance of 0.4 ohms. So basically, we have a short between here and here. Now, I don't know where that short is. I've tested both of these Zener diodes. They both check out. I've tested this capacitor. It checks out. This capacitor has the correct voltage across it anyway. It could be this capacitor. This is a tantalum capacitor, though, so that doesn't typically go bad. Or it could be something else within this board. Not sure. Finding shorts are so hard. I mean, typically capacitors are the things that short out, but you never know. Hmm. Okay, so I think I have a pretty good idea of what might be causing it. So this tantalum capacitor here, C7, if I measure it, and I'll make sure to measure the resistance across it with the right polarity just to stop anything from happening. You can see here, and you actually can't see my multimeter, but this is giving me a nice reading of 0 0.2 ohms. So I think that capacitor might be it. I'm going to pop that one out and see. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think I may have found the culprit. I just desoldered this good old tantalum capacitor. Let's see what happens when I put some voltage across it. In a theoretical working capacitor, it might see a little bit of current for a second, and then no more. It'll be charged and no current will flow. But in a shorted capacitor, we could see currents up to 10 amps and a lot of smoke. Oh, and it melted. Oh, gross. Well, that was the problem. All right. So that was the moment of truth. Uh, I'll test the resistance between these two points. Oh, also, it smells really bad in here. You can see the resistance is something way better. 22 kilo ohms. So perfect. I'm going to replace that tantalum capacitor with this small electrolytic capacitor. The tantalum capacitor was rated at 25 volts, 6.8 microfarads. This one is rated at 10 microfarads at 50 volts. I know it's not a tantalum, but it should still suffice as mostly it's being used as a filter. So because I desoldered the other one, it will be really easy to just slide in the new one and solder it in place. The new capacitor is in place. Oh, oh, I see numbers. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, you can see there 2.79 volts, 2.93 volts. It's a little bit off, but I can fix that. Also, I plugged this in the wrong way. So that's 3.14. And as I adjust the voltage on here, we can see it adjust. Now, the vo voltages aren't perfect right now. This says 4.57, this is 4.36, but that's easy. There's potentiometers back here I can adjust to make it correct. All right, so it's all calibrated, and I'll show you how well it works. And we can see that it's even more accurate in this range, 8.87, 8.87. 
it's pretty close to accurate. As far as measuring resistance goes, I've got a 10k resistor here. You can see that it's spot on, 10.01 uh, kiloohms. So this is working really good. I love those amazing neon tubes. I'd like to thank Kaiweets again for helping me out with this brand new multimeter. This thing is awesome. It's got so many features, way more features than my old one. You can measure frequency in hertz, you can measure the forward voltages of diodes, you measure capacitance. One of my favorites is you can measure temperature with that thermocouple, and it's really fast. You can measure currents and all kinds of stuff. Watch this, it even has a light. Also, this thing at the top is kind of cool. This is a way you can find live wires. Look at this. See? It uses the magnetic field that the wire generates when it's live to sense it. It's a pretty cool feature to be built into a meter. Alright, thank you for watching!